From Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! The U.S. war, so-called war against terror, has been a smashing success. There was a small group up in the tribal areas of mostly Pakistan, Afghanistan, al-Qaeda. We have succeeded in spreading it over the whole world. Now they're all everywhere. You know, West Africa, is, uh, Southeast Asia, you know, uh, simply generating more and more terror. Today, part two of Noam Chomsky on the rise of the Islamic State blowback from the U.S. drone program, the legacy of slavery in the United States, the leaks of Edward Snowden, U.S. meddling in Venezuela, and the thawing of U.S.-Cuba relations. The U.S. launched a major terrorist war against Cuba. We kind of downplay it, and what you get reported is uh, uh, CIA attempts to, you know, to kill Castro bad enough, but that was a very minor part of it. Major terrorist war is part of the background for the missile crisis, which almost led to a terminal nuclear war. And we'll hear Noam Chomsky talk about love and his new marriage. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Iraqi forces and militias are continuing their largest offensive to date against the so-called Islamic State as they seek to retake the city of Tikrit. Iranian advisors and Iranian-backed Shiite militias are playing a key role in the campaign for the Sunni city, with reports of Iranian troops even operating artillery in the area. U.S. officials, meanwhile, have expressed surprise over the Tikrit operation, and the Pentagon has said it's not providing air support because it wasn't asked. Meanwhile, in Syria, a key U.S.-backed rebel group has collapsed after a series of defeats by an al-Qaeda affiliate. Harakat Hazm, favored by the United States as a moderate group and armed with U.S. anti-tank missiles, has now allied itself with the Islamist Shamia Front. The British group CAGE has posted audio of the ISIS militant known as Jihadi John recounting an interrogation by a British agent in 2009. In the recording, Mohamed Mwazi describes how he condemned 9-11 and the deadly July 7, 2005 attacks on the London subway. I looked at him face to face now, and then he looked at me and he said, Mohamed, I said, yes. He goes, what do you think of the 7-7? I said, man, what? Innocent people have been have, have died, man. What do you think? I think this is extremism. He said, okay, what do you think of um, the, the war in Afghanistan? I said, what do I think? You know, we see the news, innocent people are getting killed. And he started telling me, what do you think of 9 11? I think I told him, this is a wrong thing. What happened was wrong. You know, what would you want would you want to say? If I, if I had the opportunity for those, those lives to come back, then I would make those lives come back. You know, I don't think there's, I, don't, I think. I think what happened is wrong. Mohammed Amwazi said the MI5 agent tried to put words in his mouth and warned him, quote, we're going to keep a close eye on you. Cage has said constant harassment and travel bans by Britain prevented Amwazi from leading a normal life. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu testifies before Congress today in a bid to stop a nuclear deal with Iran. His visit comes as Iran, the U.S. and other world powers have resumed nuclear talks ahead of a March 31st deadline. Speaking before the pro-Israel lobby group AIPAC Monday, Netanyahu gave a preview of today's address. I plan to speak about an Iranian regime that is threatening to destroy Israel that's devouring country after country in the Middle East, that's exporting terror throughout the world, and that is developing, as we speak, the capacity to make nuclear weapons, lots of them. Cables published by Al Jazeera have recently shown Netanyahu's dire warnings about Iran are out of step with his own spy agency, the Israeli Mossad. Dozens of Democrats are expected to boycott Netanyahu's address, which was arranged by House Speaker John Boehner without consulting the White House. President Obama has called on Iran to freeze sensitive nuclear activity for at least a decade as part of a nuclear deal. Speaking to Reuters, Obama also defended his relationship with Israel. Under my administration, uh, billions of dollars have gone to support uh, Israel's security, including the Iron Dome program that has protected them from uh, missiles firing uh, along their borders. Uh, the military and intelligence cooperation is unprecedented. Uh, that's not our estimation. That's the estimation of uh, the Netanyahu government. And that bond is unbreakable.
presumed Democratic presidential frontrunner Hillary Clinton has come under scrutiny for her use of a private email address to conduct official business as secretary of state. The New York Times reports Clinton's aides failed to preserve her emails on government servers in a possible violation of federal rules. Officials in Georgia have postponed the state's first execution of a woman in seven decades due to concerns over the execution drug. Kelly Renee Gissendainer was set to die Wednesday evening for plotting to kill her husband, even though her former boyfriend, who actually carried out the killing, will be up for parole in eight years after testifying against her. Gissendainer's attorneys have argued she should be spared after transforming her life through religion, but the execution was only delayed because the drug, pentobarbital, appeared cloudy. Her execution was was delayed last week due to extreme weather. Venezuela has ordered the Obama administration to reduce staff at its embassy in Caracas by 80 percent, amidst the worst diplomatic spat since President Nicolas Maduro's election in 2013. Maduro has accused right-wing opponents of fomenting a coup with U.S. support. His government has given the U.S. 15 days to cut embassy staff from 100 to 17. You can tune in to Noam Chomsky after headlines talking about the situation in Venezuela. The mayor of Cleveland has apologized after the city claimed an illegal document 12-year-old African-American Tamir Rice was to blame for his own death at the hands of police. Rice was playing with a toy gun when police fatally shot him within two seconds of their arrival. But in response to a lawsuit filed by Rice's family, the city claimed Tamir Rice's death was, quote, directly and proximately caused by his failure to exercise due care to avoid injury. Mayor Frank Jackson apologized Tuesday. We are apologizing today as a city to the family of Tamir Rice and to the citizens of the city of Cleveland for our, our poor use of words and our insensitivity in the use of those words. The news comes as the Los Angeles Police Department's facing protests for its killing of a homeless man on Skid Row, and as the Mexican government has condemned the third U.S. police killing of a Mexican citizen in the past month. Police in Santa Ana, California, killed Ernesto Javier Canepa Diaz during what they said was a robbery investigation, but few details have been released. Meanwhile, a White House task force on policing has called for a series of reforms, including increased transparency and independent probes of fatal shootings. Things. The trial of the so-called Flood Wall Street 11 is opened here in New York. On September 22nd, the day after the historic People's Climate March, thousands staged a mass sit-in in Manhattan's financial district to protest the role of big banks in the capitalist system and climate change. Over 100 people were arrested. Eleven of them have taken the charges to court. They plan to use the necessity defense to argue their actions were justified by the urgency of corporate fuel climate change. John Tarleton is one of the defendants. We've known about this climate crisis for a, over a quarter of a century. Our political and economic system have in, completely failed to address it. And uh, so it's, we believe it's legitimate for other forms of resistance to emerge to try to create the pressure to, uh, to find real solutions. And Maryland Democratic Senator Barbara Mikulski, the longest-serving woman in congressional history, has announced she will not seek re-election next year. Mikulski said she wants to spend her remaining time in the Senate working for her constituents instead of fundraising. I had to decide how I would spend my time, fighting for my job or fighting for their job. Do I spend my time raising money? Or do I spend my time raising hell? Senator Mikulski has served in Congress since 1977, spearheading measures for fair pay and coverage of women's preventive health care and paving the way for women to wear pants on the Senate floor. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Today, part two of our discussion with Noam Chomsky, the world-renowned political dissident, linguist and author, institute professor emeritus at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he's taught for more than half a century. On Monday on Democracy Now!, Aaron Maté and I interviewed him about Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's speech on Iran to Congress. Today, in part two, we look at blowback from the U.S. drone program, the legacy of slavery in the United States, the leaks of Edward Snowden, U.S. meddling in Venezuela, and the thawing of U.S. Cuba relations. We began by asking Professor Chomsky how the U.S. should respond to the self-proclaimed Islamic State. It's very hard to think of anything serious that can be done. I mean, it, it should be settled uh, diplomatically and peacefully to the extent that that's possible. It's not inconceivable.
I mean, there are uh, ISIS. It's a horrible manifestation of uh, hideous actions. It's a real danger to anyone nearby, but so are other forces. Uh, and we, we should be getting together with Iran, which has a huge stake in the matter and is the main force involved, and uh, with the Iraqi government, uh, which is uh, calling for and applauding Iranian support. And and uh, trying to work out with them some arrangement which will satisfy the legitimate demands of the Sunni population, which is the uh, uh, which is what ISIS is uh, 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 protecting and defending and gaining their support from. They're not coming out of nowhere. I mean, they are. One of the effects, the main effects of the U.S. invasion of Iraq. There are many horrible effects, but one of them was to incite sectarian conflicts that had not been there before. Uh, if you take a look at Baghdad before the invasion, uh, Sunni and Shia lived intermingled, same neighborhoods, they intermarried. Uh, uh, sometimes they say that they didn't even know <coughs> if their neighbor was uh, a Sunni or Shia. It was like knowing what Protestant sect your neighbor belongs to. It was very cl pretty close. It wasn't not claiming it was, wasn't utopia. There were conflicts, but there was no serious conflict, so much so that Iraqis at the time predicted there would never be a conflict. Well, within a couple of years, it had turned into a violent, brutal conflict. You look at Baghdad today, it's uh, segregated. Uh, what's left of the Sunni communities are isolated. People can't talk to their neighbors. There's war going on all over. The uh, ISIS is murderous and brutal. Uh, the same is true of the Shia militias, which confronted. And this is now spread over the region. There's now a major Sunni Shia conflict rending the region to sh apart, <coughs> tearing to shreds. Now, this cannot be dealt with by bombs. This is much more serious than that. It's got to be dealt with by steps towards, rec towards recovering, uh, remedying the massive damage that was initiated by the sledgehammer smashing Iraq and has now spread. And uh, that does require uh, diplomatic, peaceful means dealing with people who are uh, pretty ugly. And we're not very pretty either, for that matter. Uh, but this just has to be done. Uh, ex exactly what steps should be taken, it's hard to say. There are people whose lives are at stake, like the Assyrian Christians, the Yazidi, and so on. Uh, apparently, the fighting that protected the— we don't know a lot, but it looks as though the ground fighting that protected the Yazidi largely, was carried out by uh, PKK, the uh, uh, Turkish uh, guerrilla group that's fighting f for the Kurds in uh, Turkey, but based in northern Iraq. And they're on the U.S. terrorist list. Uh, we can't uh, uh, hope to have a strategy that uh, deals with uh, uh, ISIS while uh, uh, opposing and attacking the group that's fighting them, just as it doesn't make sense to try to have a strategy that uh, excludes Iran, the major state that's supporting uh, the Iraq and its uh, battle with ISIS. What about the fact that um, so many of those who are joining ISIS now, and a lot has been made of uh, the young young people, uh, young women and young men who are going into Syria through Turkey. I mean, Turkey is a U.S. ally. There is a border there. They freely go back and forth. That's right. And it's not just young people. Uh, one thing that's pretty striking is that it includes uh, people with um, uh, educated people, uh, doctors, uh, professionals and others, uh, whatever we we may not like it, but ISIS is uh, the idea of the Islamic Caliphate is uh, does have an appeal to large sectors of a brutalized global population, which is under severe attack everywhere, has been for a long time, and something has appeared which uh, uh, has an appeal to them, and that can't be overlooked if we want to deal with the issue. We have to ask what's the nature of the appeal? Why is it there? 
there, uh, what, how can we accommodate it and uh, uh, lead to some, if not at least amelioration of the uh, murderous conflict and maybe some kind of settlement. You can't ignore these factors if you want to deal with the issue. I want to ask you about more information that's come out on the um, British man who is known as Jihadi John, um, who appears in the Islamic State beheading videos. Um, Hamid Mwazi has been identified as that man by British security. They say he's a 26-year-old born in Kuwait who moved to the U.K. as a child and studied computer science at the University of Westminster. The British group Cage said he faced at least four years of harassment, detention, deportations, threats, and attempts to recruit him by British security agencies, which prevented him from leading a normal life. And Mwazi approached Cage in 2009, after he was detained and interrogated by the British intelligence agency, MI5, on what he called a safari vacation in Tanzania. In 2010, after Mwazi was barred from returning to Kuwait, he wrote, quote, I had a job waiting for me and marriage to get started. But now I feel like a prisoner, only not in a cage, in London. In 2013, a week after he was barred from Kuwait for a third time, Mwazi left home and ended up in Syria. At a news conference, Cage Research Director Asim Qureshi spoke about his recollections of Mwazi and compared his case to another British man, Michael Adebolajo, who hacked a soldier to death in London in 2013. Sorry, it's, it's quite hard because you know, he's such a. I'm really sorry. I didn't expect. Uh, he's, he was such a beautiful young man, really. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to imagine the trajectory, but it's not a trajectory that's unfamiliar with us, for us. We've seen Michael Adebalajo, once again, somebody that I met, you know, who came to me for help, looking to change the situation in the system. When are, when are we going to finally learn that when we treat people as if they're outsiders, they will inevitably feel like outsiders, and they will look for belonging elsewhere? That's Cage Research Director Asim Qureshi. Your response to this, Noam Chomsky? Right. If you the same, if you take a look at the uh, uh, those who perpetrated the uh, crimes in Charlie Hebdo, they also have a history of uh, oppression, uh, uh, violence. Uh, they come from an Algerian background. The uh, horrible French uh, participation in the murderous uh, war in the 90s in Algeria is their immediate background. They live under in these uh, harshly repressed areas. Uh, 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 Those—and uh, there's much more than that. So it, you, you mentioned that information is coming out, out about so-called Jihadi John. You read the British press, other information is coming out, which we don't pay much attention to. Now, for example, um, The Guardian had a, an article a couple of weeks ago uh, about an, a Yemeni boy, I think it was about 14 or so, who was murdered in a drone strike. And uh, shortly before, they had interviewed him about his history. His uh, parents and family uh, went through them, were murdered in drone strikes. He watched them burn to death. Uh, we get upset about beheadings. They get upset about seeing their father burned to death in a drone strike. He said they live in a situation of constant terror, not knowing when the person uh, 10 feet away from you is suddenly going to be blown away. That's their lives. Uh, people like uh, those who live in the uh, slums of uh, uh, around Paris, or uh, in this case, a relatively privileged uh, man under uh, harsh, pretty harsh repression in England. They also know about that. We may choose not to know about it, but they know. Uh, when we talk about beheadings, they know that in the U.S.-backed 
uh, Israeli attack on Gaza, at the points where the attack was most fierce, like the Shafaya neighborhood, uh, people weren't just beheaded. Uh, they were, their bodies were torn to shreds. Uh, people came later trying to put the pieces of the bodies together to find out who they were, you know. Uh, these things happen, too, and they have an impact. All of this has an impact, along with what was just described. And if we seriously want to deal with the question, we can't ignore that. That's part of the background of people who are reacting this way. You spoke before about how the U.S. invasion set off uh, the Sunni-Shia conflict in Iraq, and out of that came ISIS. I wonder if you see a parallel in Libya, where uh, the U.S. and NATO had a mandate to stop a potential massacre in Benghazi, but then went much further than a no-fly zone and helped topple Gaddafi. And now, uh, we, uh, four years later, we have ISIS in Libya, and they're beheading Coptic Christians, Egypt now bombing. And with the U.S. debating this expansive war measure, Libya could be next on the U.S. target list. Well, that's a very important analogy. What happened is, as you say, there was a claim that there might be a massacre in Benghazi, and in response to that, the uh, uh, there was a U.N. resolution, which had several uh, elements. One, a call for ceasefire and negotiations, which apparently Gaddafi accepted. Uh, another was uh, a no-fly zone. Okay, to stop uh, attacks in Benghazi. Uh, the three traditional imperial powers, Britain, France, and the United States, immediately violated the resolution. Uh, no diplomacy, no ceasefire. They immediately became uh, the air force of the uh, uh, rebel forces. And, uh, in fact, uh, the war itself had plenty of brutality, uh, with uh, violent militias, attacks on uh, 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 African uh, Africans living in Libya, all sorts of things. The end result is just to tear Libya to shreds. Uh, by now, it's uh, torn between two major uh, warring militias. Many other small ones. Uh, it's gotten to the point where they can't even export their main uh, export oil. It's just a disaster, total disaster. Uh, that's what happens when you strike vulnerable systems. Uh, as I said, with a sledgehammer, all kind of horrible things can happen. In the case of Iraq, it's worth recalling that uh, the, uh, there had been a, almost a decade of sanctions which were brutally destructive. Uh, we know about—we can, if we like, know about the sanctions. People prefer not to, but we can find out. There were two, there, there was a sort of humanitarian component of the sanctions, so-called. It was the Oil for Peace, Peace Program, instituted when the reports of the sanctions were so horrendous, you know, hundreds of thousands of children dying and so on, that it was necessary for the U.S. and Britain to institute some humanitarian part. Now, that was directed by uh, a prominent, respected uh, international diplomats. Dennis Halliday, who resigned, and Hans von Sponek. Both Halliday and von Sponek resigned because they called the humanitarian aspect genocidal. That's their description. Uh, von Sponek published a detailed, important book on it called, I think, uh, A Different Kind of War or something like that, which I've never seen a review of or even a mention of in the United States, uh, which detailed uh, in, in great detail exactly uh, how these uh, sanctions were devastating the civilian society uh, supporting Saddam because the people had to simply huddle under the umbrella of power for survival. Probably—they didn't say this, but I'll add it—probably saving Saddam from the fate of other dictators who the U.S. had supported and were overthrown by popular uprisings. And there's a long list of them. Uh, Somoza, Marcos, uh, Mobutu, uh, Duvalier, you know, uh, even Ceausescu, the U.S. was supporting. Uh, they were overthrown from within. Saddam wasn't, because the, society, the civil society that might have carried that out was devastated. He had a pretty efficient rationing system. People were living on it for survival. But it, just, it severely harmed the civilian society. Then comes the war. 
you know, massive war, with plenty of destruction, uh, destruction of antiquities. Uh, there's no, you know, properly uh, denunciation of ISIS for destroying antiquities. The U.S. invasion did the same thing. Uh, millions of refugees, uh, a horrible blow against the society. These things have terrible consequences. Actually, there's an interesting interview with uh, Graham Fuller. He's uh, uh, one of the leading Middle East analysts, long background in CIA, U.S. intelligence. Uh, in the interview, he says something like, uh, the U.S. created ISIS. He hastens to add that he's not joining with the conspiracy theories that are floating around the Middle East about how the U.S. is supporting ISIS. Of course, it's not. But what he says is the U.S. created ISIS in the sense that we established the background from which ISIS developed as a terrible offshoot, and we can't overlook that. MIT professor Noam Chomsky. When we come back from break, he talks about Cuba, U.S. relations with Venezuela, Edward Snowden, U.S. drones, the legacy of slavery, and a new chapter in Noam's own life. Stay with us. Iraqi musician Farat Kaduri here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. As we continue our conversation with Noam Chomsky, we turn now to Latin America. Democracy Now!'s Aaron Mate sat down with Noam Chomsky yesterday on Democracy Now!, the MIT professor emeritus. We asked him to talk about the thawing of U.S.-Cuba relations and U.S. meddling in Cuba. The U.S. has been at war with Cuba for uh, since late 1959, uh, Cuba was had been essentially a colony of the United States, a uh, virtual colony. Uh, in January 1959, uh, the Castro guerrilla forces took over. Uh, by late that year, around October, U.S. planes were already bombing Cuba from uh, Florida. In, uh, I think it's March 1960, there was a formal decision internally to overthrow the government. Uh, John F. Kennedy came in shortly after, got the Bay of Pigs. Uh, uh, after the Bay of Pigs, there was almost hysteria in Washington about how to punish the Cubans for this. Uh, Kennedy made some incredible speeches about how, you know, the future of the world is at stake and dealing with Cuba and so on. Uh, the U.S. launched a major terrorist war against Cuba. We kind of downplay it, and what you get reported is uh, uh, CIA attempts to, you know, to kill Castro bad enough, but that was a very minor part of it. Major terrorist war is part of the background for the missile crisis, which almost led to a terminal nuclear war. Uh, right after the crisis, the terrorist war picked up again. Meanwhile, the sanctions have been very harsh sanctions against Cuba, uh, right from the Eisenhower regime, picked up, extended by Kennedy, uh, uh, extended further under Clinton, uh, who actually outflanked Bush from the right on extending the sanctions. Uh, the world has been totally opposed to this. The votes at the General Assembly, you can't do it at the Security Council, because the U.S. vetoes everything, but at the General Assembly, the votes are just overwhelming. Uh, I think the last one was uh, 182 to 2, U.S. and Israel. And sometimes they pick up uh, Papua or something like that. Uh, this has been going on year after year. Uh, the U.S. is utterly isolated. Uh, not just on this issue, many others. And finally, uh, notice that Obama didn't end the sanctions. Uh, 
In fact, it didn't even end the uh, the restrictions, many of the restrictions on travel and so on. They made a mild gesture uh, towards uh, moving towards normalization of relations. That's presented here. The way it's presented here is we have to test Cuba to see if our long, as Obama put it, our efforts to improve the situation in Cuba have failed. Right, big efforts to improve the situation, terrorism, uh, sanctions. Uh, uh, the sanctions are really incredible. So if, if say, Sweden was uh, uh, sending medical equipment somewhere which had Cuban nickel in it, that had to be banned, you know, things like that. And terrorism, you mean? Uh, terrorism just it went on into the 90s. It was the worst part was under Kennedy, then picked up again in the late 70s and so on. Uh, elite, uh, major terrorists are, uh, are provided refuge in Florida. Uh, the late Bosch is one, Orlando Bosch, uh, the Posada is another. Uh, you remember there was something called the Bush Doctrine, Bush II, uh, a country that harbors terrorists is the same as the terrorists themselves. That's for others, not for us. We harbor them uh, and also support their activities. Uh, but we have to test Cuba to see if they're making successful gestures now that our old policy of bringing freedom and democracy didn't work, so we have to try a new policy. I mean, the irony of this is almost indescribable. Uh, the fact that these words can be said is shocking. It's a sign of, again, a failure to reach a minimal level of civilized awareness and behavior. Uh, but the steps, I mean, it's, it's, good, it's good that there are small steps being taken. Uh, it's, it's interesting to see what the Cuban, uh, the, the Cuban intellectual community, there is a dissident intellectual community uh, in Cuba, how they've been reacting to it. Actually, there's an interesting article about it by uh, my daughter, Avi Tomsky, who's a Cuba specialist, uh, but we don't look at that. We don't hear what they're saying. Uh, the, uh, what are they saying? What they're saying is approximately what I was just saying. You know, it's a good step that the U.S. is beginning to move, but we, they've got to begin to face up to the reality of what's been happening, which is that the U.S. has been attacking Cuba. And uh, the reason for the primary reason, probably, for Obama's uh, slight moves are that the U.S. was becoming completely isolated in the hemisphere. It's not just that the world is opposed, the hemisphere is opposed. And that's a remarkable development. Speaking of Latin America overall, <clears throat> I wanted to turn to the latest that's uh, happening in Venezuela and with U.S. Venezuelan um, relations. Venezuela has announced the arrest of an unspecified number of Americans on charges of espionage, at least some of whom have reportedly been released and left the country. Speaking at a rally, the Venezuelan president, Nicolas Maduro, said the suspects were trying to stoke anti-government political sentiment. We've detected activity, and we have captured some U.S. citizens in undercover activities, in hidden activities, espionage, trying to win over people in towns along the Venezuelan coast, trying to win over people in some neighborhoods. In Tachira, we captured a pilot of a U.S. plane of Latin origin with all sorts of documentation. President Maduro also announced new restrictions on the number of U.S. diplomats allowed in Venezuela and rule changes that will subject Americans to the same visa requirements Venezuelans face in the United States. Uh, President Maduro has also unveiled a list of American politicians barred from entering Venezuela in response to U.S. sanctions against Venezuelan officials last year. Maduro has repeatedly accused right-wing opponents of fomenting a coup with U.S. support. Now, the White House has denied the charge but said last week it's considering tools to, quote, steer the Venezuelan government in the direction they should be headed, unquote. Mm -hmm. Professor Noam Chomsky, your response. What's happening? Well, one kind of question we should immediately ask ourselves is brought up by your observation that uh, 
Venezuela is uh, planning to impose on U.S. citizens uh, the same restrictions that the United States imposes on Venezuelans. Why do we impose those restrictions? Uh, suppose, say, that uh, Iran uh, was sending uh, people to the United States to foment uh, opposition to the government and a call for change in the regime. Uh, how would we react to that? Um, unimaginable. But we consider it our right to do that elsewhere. Incidentally, that is not, this is not a justification of Venezuelan actions. Uh, the fact that we do it doesn't make it justified. Uh, if uh, others do it, no, it's not justified. Uh, Venezuela has severe internal problems. There's no doubt about that. What is your assessment of Maduro and how he compares to President Chavez? Well, Maduro, uh, Chavez had uh, a, a charisma and popular support, uh, an appeal that Maduro doesn't have. Uh, but there is a hard, uh, there are difficult uh, economic circumstances to face within Venezuela. Uh, the uh, uh, the economy is in difficult shape. The, uh, during the Chavez years, there were progress in many areas, but there was no success in moving Venezuela away from a strictly oil-based economy. There was very little in the way of <coughs> diversification of the economy, the development of agriculture, development of industry, and so on. And that's a pretty weak read for an economy to rest on. Uh, it's not a successful development program, and that's now showing up. There were uh, um, there were, um, inflation problems. There's, they were never able to deal with the problem of internal violence. It's a, not the most violent country in the hemisphere, but it's pretty bad. And uh, these are serious internal problems. They're undoubtedly being exacerbated to some extent by U.S. involvement. Uh, uh, by rights, we should be trying to support Venezuela to overcome its internal problems, not trying to light fires that will make them worse. How could the U.S. do that? Uh, we could, for example, eliminate those restrictions that you're talking about. We could be uh, providing uh, uh, economic and uh, technical assistance that could be used to uh, uh, overcome internal difficulties. Uh, these are things that could be done. Instead, what we're doing is uh, uh, maintaining a position of extreme hostility. This is not to, there's plenty of problems internally, and our actions are purposely making them worse. It's not by accident. We want, the U.S. government wants to make them worse because it wants the regime overthrown. Uh, Chavez's own estimate, whether it's accurate or not, I can't judge, but what he's, uh, his position is that, uh, that uh, the United States was willing to tolerate his government up to the point when he began to play a significant role in OPEC and convinced the OPEC countries, the oil-producing countries, to uh, lower production in order to raise prices. And the U.S. Uh, was strongly opposed to that, and what he says is that's when the U.S. government turned against him, uh, backed the U.S. backed openly backed the 2002 coup, which saw, which briefly overthrew the government uh, and uh, continued uh, subversive activities. That's his judgment. MIT professor Noam Chomsky. Coming up, he talks about Edward Snowden, drone warfare, the legacy of slavery in the United States, and Noam's new love. All that and more coming up. Aunque nadie me ve nunca contigo Y como pasa el tiempo 
performed by Silvia Rodriguez and Luis Eduardo Alte, here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Aaron Mate. We're spending the hour with MIT professor, author and activist Noam Chomsky. We sat down with him Monday. I asked him about the significance of the leaks by National Security Agency whistleblower Edward Snowden and whether he should be allowed to return to the United States without facing any charges. He should be welcomed as uh, a person who carried out uh, the obligations of a citizen. He informed American citizens of what their government is doing to them. Uh, that's exactly what uh, a person who has real patriotism, not the flag-waving type, but real patriotism would do. So he should be honored, not just allowed back. It's uh, the people in the government who should be on trial, not him. I was talking to a friend who was saying, you know, when you talk about Edward Snowden, what about the issues of terrorism and having to uh, spy on those who might want to hurt others? If they want to—first uh, the, the, uh, of all, it's pretty—we uh, can raise this question, but it's academic, because they are not preventing terrorism. Uh, you recall when the Snowden revelations came out, the immediate reaction from the government, highest level, Keith Alexander or others, was that uh, these NSA uh, programs had uh, stopped, I think they said, 54 or so acts of terror. Uh, gradually, when the press started asking questions, it was whittled down to about 12. Uh, finally, it came down to one. And that act of terror was a man who had sent, I think, uh, $8,500 to Somalia. Uh, that's the yield of this massive program. So, uh, And it is not intended to stop terrorism. It's intended to control the population. Uh, th that's quite different. You have to be very cautious in accepting claims by power systems. They have no reason to tell you the truth. And you have to look and ask, well, what is the truth? <laughs> and uh, this system is not a system for protecting terrorism. Actually, you can say the same about the drone assassination program. That's a global assassination program, far and away the worst act of terror in the world. It's also a terror-generating program, and they know it uh, from high places. You can find quotation after quotation where they know it. I take this one case that I mentioned before, this child who uh, was murdered in a drone strike and after having watched his uh, family burned to death uh, by drone strikes. In Yemen. What's the effect of— uh, uh, of this on people. Well, it's to create terror. Uh, the uh, uh, close analyses have shown that that's exactly what happens. Uh, it's a very important book by uh, Akbar Ahmed, who's a well important anthropologist who's a Pakistani who uh, studies tribal systems. He'd worked in the Northwest Territories and so on, and it's called uh, The Thistle and the Drone. And he goes through in some detail the effect on tribal society of uh, simply murdering, what the, from their point of view, just murdering people at random. The drone attacks, remember, are aimed at people who are suspected of maybe someday wanting to harm us. I mean, suppose, say, that Iran was killing people in the United States and Israel who they thought would might someday want to harm them. They could find plenty of people. Uh, would we consider that legitimate? Uh, it's, again, we have the right to carry out mass murder of suspects who we think might harm us someday. Now, how does the world look at this? How do the people look at this in this uh, village where this child was, who said that they're terrorized uh, by constant drone strikes uh, all over northwest Pakistan? That's true. Now it's over most of the world. Um, the U.S. war, so-called war against terror, has been a smashing success. There was a small group up in the tribal area areas of mostly Pakistan, Afghanistan, al-Qaeda, uh, we have succeeded in spreading it over the whole world. Now they're all everywhere. 
you know, West Africa, is, uh, Southeast Asia, you know, uh, simply generating more and more terror. And I, I think it's, you know, it's, it's not that the U.S. is trying to generate terror. It's simply that it doesn't care. I wanted to ask you about Syriza in Greece, uh, a movement that started as a grassroots movement. Now they have taken power, Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras. And then you have Spain right now. Uh, we recently spoke to Pablo Iglesias, the secretary general of the group called Podemos that was founded, what, um, an anti-austerity party that has rapidly gained popularity. A month after establishing itself last year, they won five seats in the European Parliament, and some polls show they could take the next election, which would mean that Pablo Iglesias, the 36-year-old political science professor and longtime activist, could possibly become the prime minister of Europe's fifth largest economy. He came here to New York for just uh, about 72 hours, and I asked him to talk about what austerity measures have meant in Spain. Austerity means that people is is expulsed uh, of their homes. Austerity means that the, the social services don't work anymore. Austerity means that uh, public schools have not the the elements, the, the means to develop their activity. Austerity means that the countries have not sovereignty anymore, and, and we we became a colony of the financial powers and, and a colony of, of Germany. Austerity probably means the, the end of, of democracy. I think if we don't have um, democratic control of economy, we don't have democracy, it's impossible to separate economy and, and democracy, in my opinion. That was Pablo Iglesias, um, the head of this new anti-austerity group in Spain called Podemos, which means in English, we can. The significance of these movements— It's a very significant, but notice the reaction. Uh, the reaction to Syriza was extremely savage. Uh, they made a little bit of progress in their negotiations, but not much. The Germans came down very hard on them. You mean in dealing with the debt? In the dealing with them, and sort of forced them to back off from almost all their uh, proposals. Uh, um, what's going on with the austerity is really class war. Uh, as an economic program, uh, austerity under recession makes no sense. It just makes the situation worse. So the Greek debt relative to GDP has actually gone up during the period of uh, which is well, the policies that are supposed to overcome the debt. In the case of Spain, uh, the debt was not public debt, it was private debt, it was the actions of the banks. And that means also the German banks. Remember, when a bank makes a, a, a dangerous, a risky uh, borrowing, somebody is making a risky lending. Uh, and uh, the policies that are designed by the Troika, you know, are basically paying off the banks, the perpetrators, much like here. The population is suffering. But one of the things that's happening is that the, uh, you know, the social democratic policies, so-called welfare state, is being eroded. That's class war. It's not an economic policy that makes any sense as to, to end a, a serious recession. And uh, there is a reaction to it. Greece, uh, uh, Spain, uh, some in Ireland, may have growing elsewhere, France. But uh, it's a very dangerous situation. Could lead to a right-wing response, very right-wing. Um, the alternative to Syriza might be Golden Dawn, the neo-Nazi party. And then you have in the United States a uh, movement around accountability overall. Um, it's the 50th anniversary of the Selma uh, Bloody Sunday, March 7th, when uh, John Lewis, now a congressman, and scores of others had their heads beaten in by Alabama state troopers. It's 50 years later, and you have the Black Lives Matter movement. You have these stories repeatedly around the country of uh, police officers killing uh, young people and not-so-young people of color. What do you make of this movement, and do you see the anti-austerity movement in uh, Europe, um, the accountability movement in the United States, the movement around climate change? Do you see these coalitions? blessing in any way? They should. But in, in actual fact, the 
degree of coalescence is not high. Uh, we should remember that uh, Tick Selma, uh, if, if you listen to the rhetoric on Martin Luther King Day, it's instructive. It typically ends with the I Have a Dream speech and the voting rights. And Martin Luther King didn't stop there. Uh, he went on to condemning the war in Vietnam and to raising class issues. He began to raise class issues and turn to the North. At that point, he fell out of favor and disappeared. Uh, he was trying to, he was assassinated uh, when he was trying to organize a poor people's movement, and he was supporting a sanitation worker strike in, uh, in uh, Memphis. There was supposed to be a march to Washington to establish a poor people's movement, appeal to Congress to do something about class issues. Well, the march actually took place after his death, led by his widow, ended up in Washington. They set up a tent city, a resurrection city. This is the most liberal Congress in history, probably. Tolerated it briefly, then sent in the police in the middle of the night and drove him out of town. And that's disappeared from the rhetoric on Martin Luther King Day. So it's, it's OK to condemn a racist sheriff in Alabama, but not us, please. Don't touch our privilege and power. And uh, that's a large part of the background. Uh, these issues are very real. There's more issues here. Racism is a very serious problem in the United States. There's, take a look at the scholarly work on it, say George Fredrickson's uh, study of uh, white supremacy, comparative study. Uh, he, he concludes, I think, plausibly that the white supremacy in the United States was even more extreme and savage than in South Africa. Uh, just think of our own history. You know, our economy, our wealth, our privilege relies very heavily on a century of horrifying slave labor camps. Uh, the cotton, cotton production was not just the fuel of the Industrial Revolution. It was the basis for the, uh, uh, the financial system, the uh, merchant system, commerce, uh, England as well. These were bitter, brutal slave labor camps. There's a recent study by Edward Baptiste which comes out with some startling information. It's called—actually, the title is startling, something like, uh, the half was never told which is more or less true, was never told. But, for example, he shows pretty convincingly that in the slave labor camps, the plantations, we call them politely, uh, the uh, productivity increased more rapidly than in industry with no technological advantage, advance, just the bullwhip, just by driving people harder and harder to the point of survival, they were able to increase productivity and profit. And it's not just the he also points out that the word torture is not used in discussion of this period he introduces it should be used. I mean, these are camps that could have impressed the Nazis. And it is a large part of the basis for our wealth and privilege. Uh, is there a slave museum in the United States? Actually, the first one is just being established now by private, uh, some private donor. I mean, this is the core of our history, along with the uh, extermination or expulsion of the native population. But it's, it's not part of our consciousness. Noam, you're headed off on a Latin America trip right now for a month. You'll be in Brazil. You'll be giving talks in Argentina. Um, when you go to Brazil, you're going to be meeting your new family. That's correct. And I was wondering if you could talk a little about that. Well, we've been talking about a variety of things that range from unpleasant to horrific, but that we shouldn't overlook the fact that the world has some wonderful things in it, too. And I got a unexpected, wondrous gift from Brazil that fell into my arms not long ago. We're now Valeria. We're now about to celebrate our first anniversary and off to Brazil to meet Valeria's family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
And what is that like for you? Uh, you are um, seen around the world by many as uh, not only as a person who shares incredible political insight in the world, but really as a role model. And so, can you talk personally about your your own life? Uh, I'm a very private person. I've never talked about my own life much, but uh, you know, I've, I've uh, personally I've. I've been very fortunate in my life with uh, I've had there, there have been tragedies there have been wonderful things and uh, Valeria's sudden appearance is one of those wonderful things <laughs> you said after your first wife Carol died that life without love is empty something along those lines can you talk about that I could produce some clichés which have the merit of being true. A life without love is a pretty empty affair. It's a and your own tireless schedule, keeping up your lectures, writing extensive articles, uh, and still tirelessly answering the emails from correspondents from people around the world. When I was in college, I remember I wrote you several times and got back these long, detailed answers on complex questions, and there's people across the globe who could attest to a similar experience. Do you feel a certain obligation to respond to people? Because nobody would fault you at the age of 86 now if you took more time for yourself. Uh, I don't know if it's an obligation exactly. Uh, it's a privilege, really. Uh, these are the important people in the world. Uh, I remember a wonderful comment by Howard Zinn about the countless number of unknown people who are the driving force in history and in progress. And that's people like, uh, I didn't know you, but people like you writing from college. Uh, these are people who deserve respect, encouragement, the hope for the future. They're uh, uh, an inspiration for me personally. You mentioned your daughter, Avi, um, uh, being an expert on Cuba, among others. Um, you have three children that you and Carol raised, uh, now broadening your family to Valeria as well. Um, can you talk about uh, your philosophy of child-rearing in a very politically active family. You have said in the past that you thought, because of your opposition to the war in Vietnam, for example, you might spend years in jail. Came very close. Came close enough so that uh, by 1967, 68, when resistance activities were at their heights, and I was uh, an unindicted co-conspirator in one trial, and the prosecutor announced I'd be the leading person in the next trial. But in which trial? Uh, pardon? In which trial? These were the so-called trials of the resistance. The first was called the Spock Coffin trial, although a lot to say about that. The next, was, the next ones were called off, mainly because of the Tet Offensive in Vietnam, which uh, uh, convinced the American business community that the war's going to drag on, and they rather significant power play. They compelled Johnson to start backing off, and one of the things they did was end the trials. But it was serious enough so that my wife, Carol, uh, went back to school after 16 years to get a finish up with her a doctoral degree, since we had three kids to take care of. But uh, during those years, although I was extremely active, I mean, there were times when I was giving, you know, seven talks a day and going to demonstrations and so on, but I always uh, managed, took care to spend as much time as I could, quality time, with kids when they were growing up. So what gives you hope? Things like what you described. Also, the wonderful things in the world of the kind that I mentioned, like my wife. <laughs> he professor, world-renowned linguist, dissident, author Noam Chomsky. To hear part one of our interview yesterday, when he talked about Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu's speech to Congress today, you can go to our website. This is just a clip. Basically, a joint effort by Netanyahu and uh, uh, 
with rep mostly Republican hawks in the United States to uh, undermine any possibility of a uh, negotiated settlement with Iran. Uh, neither Israel nor U.S. hawks uh, want to tolerate a deterrent in the region to their violence. Noam Chomsky. To hear both of our hours of interview with him, go to democracynow.org. And that does it for our broadcast. Democracy Now! is produced by Mike Burke, Renee Feltz, Nermeen Sheikh, Dina Guzder. I'm Amy Goodman with Aaron Mate for another edition of Democracy Now!